This week on Jerusalem Dateline, political earthquake in Israel as Prime Minister Bennett and Foreign Minister Lapid dissolve their government. And the Iranian-Israeli covert war comes out of the shadows. And the story of one Ukrainian refugee family who prayed and saw God answer. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Political earthquake in Israel. In a joint statement, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett and Foreign Minister Yair Lapid announced they're dissolving the Knesset, putting an end to their struggling coalition government. That could bring the country to its fifth national election in three and a half years. The announcement on national television preempted a Knesset vote on Wednesday that was likely to bring down the government anyway. My friend, Foreign Minister Yair Lapid and I decided to work together to dissolve the Knesset and to set to hold elections at an agreed time, at the same time transferring the power in an orderly manner and ensuring the national interest of the state of Israel. Over the last month, the coalition destabilized by the withdrawal of coalition members. Bennett said he had fought hard to maintain the coalition. In recent weeks, we have done everything that could be done to preserve this government, which in our eyes, its continued existence is in the national interest. The decision transfers power to Lapid, who becomes prime minister and remains foreign minister during the transition. Elections are scheduled for October 25th. Lapid commended Bennett for putting the country's interests ahead of his own. Even if we're going to elections in a few months, our challenges as a state cannot wait. We must address the high cost of living, manage the struggle against Iran, Hamas, and Hezbollah, and face the forces that threaten to make Israel an undemocratic state. The government was the most diversified in Israel's history, uniting eight parties, not only from the left and right, but for the first time, including an Arab Islamist party. Opposition leader Benjamin Netanyahu, who stands to gain the most, took the credit for the fall of the government. This is an evening of great news for the citizens of Israel. After a determined struggle of the opposition in the Knesset and great suffering of the public in Israel, it is clear to everyone that the most failing government in the history of the country has ended its way. Netanyahu charged that the government was dependent on a party that supported terrorists and vowed not to sit in a government with the Islamist party of Mansour Abbas. My friends and I will form a broad national government headed by the Likud, a government that will lower taxes, that will lower prices, will lead Israel to tremendous achievements, including expanding the circle of peace as we have already done, and above all, a government that will return the national pride to the citizens of Israel so that you can walk the streets with your head held high. For more on what the Israeli government decision means and what results Israelis might be looking at from elections, I talked with CBN News Senior Editor, John Waggy. Well, John Waggy, CBN News Senior Editor, thanks for joining us. Tell us your analysis after this coalition government led by uh, Prime Minister Neftali Bennett and Yair Lapid has fallen. Well, Chris, I think a lot of people were surprised that the government lasted this long. It was united in one issue, over one issue, and that is they didn't want Benjamin Netanyahu to be prime minister. And so with the dissolution of the government, uh, now we have possibly a three month period uh, where it looks like at the end of it all, if nothing changes, Netanyahu may be prime minister again. So uh, it was pretty much destined to fail, I think. Uh, Some of their supporters think they did a good job in the interim of trying to maintain what they call a diverse government because it included an Arab party, an Arab Islamist party. But uh, the handwriting was pretty much on the wall from the moment last June when they put this government together. And it looks like now we might have a window. I mean, maybe it's just a few days uh, because they vote on the uh, disillusion next week that Netanyahu could actually form a government. You know, that's what's going on behind the scenes, uh, Chris. Uh, Many of the parties who were on the right, who might have aligned with Netanyahu, uh, but decided uh, last year to abandon him, uh, now are saying there's no way that they will do it. But there are individual uh, members of the Knesset that can break away from their party. And, and that we're seeing that in Yamina. That's what brought down the government mm-hmm. uh, in the first place is Natalie Bennett's uh, 
co-members of parliament uh, abandon him. So if that happens and Netanyahu could put together 61, it's still possible that Israel can avoid elections. And uh, the, the, the target for that is very slim. Uh, but he's working it like crazy. And there are people behind the scenes, like apparently like uh, Ayelet Shaked from the Yamina party mm-hmm. who are who are interested in doing just that to spare the Israeli people from another election, the fifth one in three and a half years. Talk to us about what's happened in the last year. It, has the the right parties, have they gained some strength? And what about, uh, you know, Israelis views on who should be prime minister? Yeah, that's interesting, Chris. Yes, the right parties have gained strength, but the latest poll shows uh, that if the parties were in their traditional alignment of right now, Netanyahu still wouldn't be able to form a government uh, if this result were to take place three months from now. But three months is a long time. And uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, the, the parties are, uh, they have been gaining strength. And what you mentioned about the polls, Consistently since June of 2021, the polls have shown that Netanyahu is far and away the preferred choice to be prime minister. And so uh, under Israel's parliamentary system, it's been difficult for him to do that. But he's maintained a 17, 20 point edge all along. And even now, as a head of uh, the new prime minister in waiting, uh, Yeshatid leader uh, Yair Lapid, uh, Netanyahu leads him 37 to 21 percent, for instance. So he's, he's got a wide lead uh, of popular support to be prime minister. He just has to get through the parliamentary system uh, to, to make it happen. Turning to Iran, for years, what's been called a war between wars has existed between Israel and Iran, where much of the fighting takes place in the shadows. But now the shadow war more and more is coming out into the open. Recently, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett announced new rules of engagement with Iran called Operation Octopus. He said, in the past year, the state of Israel has taken action against the head of the terrorist octopus. The days of immunity in which Iran attacks Israel and spreads terrorism via its regional proxies but remains unscathed are over. I think it's well overdue for both Israel and Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrainis, all of these countries that have been victims of the Iranian regime's proxy activity to start to hold Iran accountable rather than the proxies. Some see a ratcheting up of Israel's covert and even overt operations to thwart Iran's nuclear and conventional missile and drone programs. It could explain the mysterious deaths recently of a number of Iranian nuclear scientists and military leaders. Another example, Israel's recent attack on the Damascus airport, which Israel sees as a major conduit of Iranian weapons on their way to Hezbollah in Syria. Now Israel says Iran is threatening to retaliate by kidnapping or killing Israelis in the region, and especially Turkey. We're currently witnessing Iranian attempts to attack Israelis in various overseas locations. The security services of the State of Israel are working to thwart attempted attacks before they are launched. We will continue to strike those who send the terrorists and those who send those who send them. Our new rule is, whoever sends, pays. Israel's Defense Minister Benny Gantz announced a regional cooperative Middle East air defense led by the U.S. It can help with anything related to Iran's attempts to attack countries of the region using rockets, missiles, cruise missiles, and UAVs. This program is already operative and has already thwarted Iranian attempts that I spoke about on other occasions, both here and in the Middle East in general. With the collapse of the Israeli government, Middle East expert Eli Konim says Israel is entering a dangerous season. The regime can can see all of this as a moment of vulnerability for the Israelis and uh, and try to take advantage. My hope is that the Israelis, as much as they're dealing with elections and cobbling together coalitions and all that, that they do keep their focus on what they call the existential threat to them that the Iranian regime poses. Coming up, what's happening in the Gulf with the Abraham Accords? It's been nearly two years since Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain signed the Abraham Accords, followed by agreements between Israel and Morocco in Sudan. And despite regional challenges, they are going strong. I sat down with Israel's first ambassador to Bahrain, Ambassador Eitan Na'e, in Manama, 
to find out more about how relations are shaping up. History was made on the White House lawn uh, you know, about a year and a half ago. What changes have you seen since that uh, momentous uh, signing on the White House lawn till today? I saw a lot of progress. I saw uh, two embassies, uh, two Israeli embassies open in the Gulf, one in the UAE, one in Bahrain, a consulate general that was opened uh, in Dubai, dozens of, uh, of agreements. Uh, that were signed, 40 uh, agreements and papers and MOUs with, uh, with Bahrain, uh, dozens uh, with, uh, with the UAE, uh, free trade agreement that we signed with the UAE just recently. So really a lot uh, that happened in a short period of time. Relationship are still, uh, you know, in its infancy. Mm -hmm. Need more nurturing and protection. Yeah. You've been ambassador to the UAE, now ambassador here to Bahrain. What's the reaction from the Emiratis and the Bahrainis and the people here in the Gulf to the Abraham Accords? Look, we are welcomed here. Uh, wherever I go, uh, I'm, I'm not saying that I've been to every house here, and sure enough, there are people here who don't like uh, are staying here. But the people that I see, uh, whether it's uh, the leadership, whether it's the business community, whether it's uh, people that I meet, are very warm and, uh, and welcoming. And I think that they believe in, in what we're doing, in, in creating a new reality. Why would the Bahrainis take such a risk for peace just 100 miles from their mortal enemy, Iran? I think the Bahrainis are seizing the opportunity. The opportunity that is uh, presented by having peaceful relations in the region and peaceful relationships uh, with, uh, with Israel. We have experience that we are happy to share. Uh, we have a country, a uh, friendly country here, um, with uh, some of the same problems that uh, we face, a shortage of water, a need of technology, uh, innovative spirit mm -hmm. that, that you can find here in, uh, in Bahrain. And I think that putting these two together uh, can put us onto some great things in the future. What should people in the West know, say specifically in the United States, what do they need to know about the Abraham Accords? That there are a significant, uh, in fact, historical change to the course of events in the Middle East. They are an effort uh, to take a road that has not been taken before, establish a relationship uh, between Israel and Arab countries, and not just that, it's proving to the rest of the Arab countries, to the rest of the world, and to the rest of the people in this region, that it is possible. Uh, we try to build a model that hopefully will be copied, a model and type of relationships and type of corporations where other young people, especially young people, will, will look at their leaders and tell them, but why not us? Why can't we join uh, this uh, really uh, big effort to, to make the life of everybody uh, better, more secure and prosperous? What threat does Iran pose not only to Israel, but to many of these Gulf nations? Iran poses an ex existential threat to my country, uh, to Israel. Uh, they said it out loud, we will wipe Israel off the map. A nuclear weapon uh, makes it uh, much more, uh, uh, or, or way more easy uh, to achieve. Uh, our leaders, uh, many leaders, said that we will not allow, never again. But also here in the region, uh, we see what Iran's uh, actions and Iran proxies from Yemen to Syria, Lebanon, Gaza are doing. And with the nuclear weapons, Iran will see, we might see Iran, we'll see. Iran unhinged and is exactly the kind of threat that we, uh, that, that, that we are facing, uh, whether it's uh, rockets and missiles over to, um, uh, to Abu Dhabi or Saudi or Israel. They tried it all. So Ambassador, right now there's on again, off again, negotiations about the Iranian nuclear deal. What kind of reaction are you hearing from the Bahrainis and the Emiratis here in the Gulf? We hear from them exactly what we say. Uh, I think that the threat and the threat perception, the threat levels are pretty, pretty identical uh, by those who live in this region, by those who experience the kind of behavior that Iran got uh, infamous for. And um, the threat, uh, the, uh, the concern is, is real. Uh, we all know that the mother of all problems in the Middle East is, is Iran. What role does media play in the Abraham Accords and what's reported here from the region? The role of, of, of the media is to really show the truth uncut. To show the truth, to give the full picture and to explain to people uh, what we're trying to do here. And that is an immensely important uh, uh, thing to do. People need to see the whole truth, not just parts of it. Up next, could a trip to Israel increase biblical literacy among the youth? 
Some say yes. Recent surveys have shown some alarming results when it comes to biblical literacy among young Christians. But some say a trip to Israel could help firm up their faith. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl spoke with Scott Phillips, CEO of Passages, an organization dedicated to bringing Christian students to the Holy Land. You've been talking uh, about some surveys, recent surveys of Gen Z um, and some disturbing facts. Tell us what that's all about. Well, I think what we're seeing is more and more um, young people, young Christians particularly, have less and less of a, a, a biblical worldview uh, and have less and less biblical knowledge, particularly Gen Z. Um, you see a recent survey out, I believe it's by Barna, that says, you know, only 4% uh, of Gen Z have a biblical worldview. And that's down, you know, from 6% from a previous generation, 8% from a previous generation before that. And so I think what you're seeing is just an unfamiliarization with the Bible, I think, which can create theological issues, which can create um, maybe a distorted view of the Bible and God's story. Yeah, I know uh, there was an, another uh, survey that also talked about 40% uh, of that generation uh, thought, yeah, Jesus is just like me. He sinned too. What, what do you think is behind all this, this lack of, of, of knowledge of the Bible? Well, and I, that's a great question. And I think that particular, um, my, I guess, theory on, on why people may have think Jesus sinned is because they have a lack of Bible knowledge. Um, they have a lack of the story of the Bible. They have a lack of the understanding of why Jesus would even come, that he had to be sinless in order to be the sacrifice for our sins, which Christianity is built on. But I think a lot of that comes from a lack of knowing the Bible and knowing its full story. So what do you think we could do about that? Well, you know, that's that's also a good question. I think that, you know, this generation, it's a wonderful generation. I mean, there's so much promise, so much potential, so much calling. And I think that this generation, they want authenticity and they want to touch, they want to feel, they want something tangible. And of course, sometimes faith can't be tangible, but we do have a place called Israel. We have a place called the Holy Land. And we know that these are the places where many stories in the Bible took place, where many of these characters that we've read about, many of these stories, God's ultimate redemptive story unfolded mostly in the land of Israel. And so I think for them to be able to go there, to touch it, to feel it, to put it with the stories of the Bible and also have someone help them along and show them, okay, you know, uh, Abraham, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the kings, the prophets ultimately point to Jesus. And then the disciples took that message to the nations. And for them to understand that full redemption of why Jesus had to come, he didn't come out of a vacuum. He was born in the land of Israel. He was a Jew. So Christianity was born out of the Hebrew scriptures, out of Judaism. And that's important to understand, to understand why he even came and why he had to die on the cross, why he had to be a sacrifice for our sins. And so I think if they can come see it and put the stories together in the ultimate redemptive narrative, touch, feel it, and know that it's a tangible thing, that it was real. We hear that time and time again with our students. So anything you'd like to add, Scott? You know, if we can just get more and more next generation Christian leaders over to the land where their faith was born so they can just encounter their spiritual heritage and get in touch with those deep roots, I think we're going to have a firmly rooted next generation of Christian leaders. Still ahead, the story of one Ukrainian refugee family helped by Christians in Poland. European nations are opening their arms to Ukrainian refugees escaping the war, especially Poland, where more than 3.5 million Ukrainians have fled. One family prayed to God for direction after they crossed the border and found shelter and comfort at a home supported by CBN Ministries. When I heard the sound of the explosions, it felt like someone was attacking my heart. I didn't know what it was, but I panicked. A friend texted Anya saying Russians had invaded Ukraine. She didn't believe it until the attack continued. I heard the sound of the rockets, and I was afraid that the bomb was going to destroy our home and kill us all. It was horrible. While her father had to stay behind, Anya fled the war-torn country with her mother and sister. 
When they arrived in Poland, they didn't know where to go. I prayed to Jesus and God the Creator for our safety. I knew that he would rescue our family. God heard their cry for help, and Anya's family landed here at this refugee home, which is supported by Operation Blessing and Orphan's Promise. I'm so thankful to God that we arrived here unharmed. He answered my prayer. The moment we got here, all my fear and panic went away. I'm so grateful for the people of God who have helped us. Operation Blessing and Orphan's Promise are sheltering many Ukrainian families, just like Anya's, at this refugee home. From traumatized children to heartbroken parents and grandparents, everyone is being supported and loved here. Praise God we're safe here, and we have food and other things we need here. I would like to thank all the donors and volunteers who have come forward to help and support us. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.